Look, he's a, he's an absolute legend in, in, in our circles, and that's this side of the microphone and this side of those that write sport for a living. Steve Mass scored out of Australia. Now, domiciled in London. He's been a league guru for as long as I can remember. What a warm welcome to the show, mate. Thanks so much for your time. Hey, Martin. I've been uh, travelling around um, promoting my book, and I'm starting to look like a guru too. I'm <laughs> quite wide around the middle at the moment. So. <laughs> look, you're in Auckland tomorrow, aren't you? Um, and it's um, so it's, it's somewhere out in Mission Bay that you've actually got what? And this is where you talk about your book. You've got an audience and everything. Yeah, that's right. Now I've done I've done a book on the uh, 1997 season, the only year we had two rugby league competitions in Australasia, and I'm doing a little launch uh, tonight, uh, Wednesday night, um, at St Helier's Bay at the Pigeon uh, from 5:30, and uh, quite a few luminaries are, um, are, are threatening to sh- uh, show up. Um, so yeah, I'm pretty excited because this is obviously a very important um, place for um, the game's history and and that year as well, of course, with the Warriors being in Super League, but it being a pretty divided club back then, wasn't it? With uh, plenty of people wanted to go back to the uh, ARL. So, uh, yeah, I'm really, really thrilled to be here. Ultimately, was it good or bad for Rugby League that that year-long war? Yeah, I was just with uh, the legendary Ray Haffenden, who I know as a former Kiwis team manager, and but uh, the listeners would know he's done just about everything uh, from playing uh, upwards in, in rugby league in, in this country. And he asked me the same question. And, you know, I, I think I think it broke up a lot of sort of uh, cronyism in the game, uh, a lot of some, some favouritism that was uh, obviously kicking around where there were the establishment clubs in Sydney and, and Sydney kind of uh, ran things. So I think, I think that was a good thing. But nevertheless, um, the big question, which I don't think anyone can answer, is what would have happened if we hadn't had the war? And, and you know, some of the clubs that... Um, have survived uh, probably wouldn't have and some of the clubs that haven't survived might still be around today because uh, you know it, it depended which way you jumped and, and when you jumped so that the answer to that question depends on um, which club you support and, and, and what in rugby league you hold dear and, and which things that you don't think are so important it's not a not an easy question to answer it depends on your perspective Ultimately, though, they came back together for 1998. So 1996 was, you know, what we what we look at now called the NRL. 97, of course, there were two separate competitions going on. Came back 98. How important then that it didn't linger and it did get resolved? Yeah, the, well, the ARL and um, and Super, Super League, um, uh, you know, end up forming a joint venture. Uh, and until uh, the, the second decade of this century, uh, News Corp had the first right of refusal on TV rights as a result of that peace deal. And that probably um, restricted the game's uh, um, income, really, because it, it, there was there was limited competition uh, for those rights. But no, anyone who can, is old enough to remember, us oldies remember that uh, people were losing a lot of interest in the sport, weren't they, back in 96, 97. Um, and, you know, if it hadn't been for Newcastle winning that competition, that was the, the shining light, really, the sort of uh, working class steel town, the last place left that still cared about the sport, I actually won the ARL competition uh, that year. And that gave the ARL some uh, bargaining chips when they went to the table with news. And then perhaps it's the biggest reason why we still have a competition that's recognisable uh, compared to what we had before. Otherwise, uh, if, if it had gone a different way, perhaps the competition today might look a bit more like Super League. It was oh, supremely important, mate, because, you know, I don't think I, I think rugby league was sinking from the centre of popular culture. Uh, in 1997, and I think that that demise would have continued if we had have continued with dual competitions in 98. Steve Mascourt is with us. He appears at St Helier's Bay tonight, 5:30. The book Two Tribes: The Whole, The Untold Story of the Super League War and the Birth of the NRL. It's uh, you know when you mention um, the the Knights beating Manly and Darren Albert, of course, um, you know it was it was it was uh, Joey Johns, you know that inside pass and all of that. I bet I could ask 100 league fans who won the Super League and who did they play, and I bet 99 or so forth wouldn't actually remember because it was Brisbane against Cronulla. But the thing is, is the ARL final got all the attention and seems to have been the final that everyone remembers. Why is that? Yeah, for the reasons I I mentioned, a lot of people thought that the Super League competition, I mean, people who don't care about business, uh, you know, sort of thought that Super League was just set up for Brisbane and so Brisbane could win, <laughs> uh, which is, wish it was that simple. But uh, that is what happened, right? So it's exactly what everyone expected uh, happened in, in the Super League competition. And whereas uh, in, we had a team winning the competition against the odds, 
They'd lost the last 10, 11, 12 times. Uh, they played Manly. They were considered no hope. And uh, as I said, Newcastle still cared about rugby league because they hadn't had any success before. So um, it, one story was very compelling and, and one story was pretty predictable. And, and that's why. Although, you know, I think uh, Super League did contribute to the sort of uh, annals of the game as far as great contests that year with that tri-series final that went for 111 minutes and Noel Goldthorpe kicked a field goal. It's still the longest... Uh, game of first-class rugby league uh, ever played. Uh, so it's not to say that Super League was uh, was completely legless when it came to putting on entertainment or putting on memorable games. But that is the most important grand final of all time. I've got no doubt about that. And, you know, alongside one or two others, it, it's also the best. I'm going to run you through the Super League clubs. And, you know, people, this is really important to remember. Auckland Warriors, okay, they're still there. The Broncos are there. The Raiders are there. The Dogs are there. The Panthers are there. The Cowboys are there. And the Sharks are there. So out of the, out of the, the eight teams, there are still six of them, or five or six of them that are there. Obviously, the Hunter Mariners aren't there. The Adelaide Rams, the Perth Reds. Was that the end of Australia thinking that the NRL could actually be a continent-wide competition? Well, I think it was um, it was the end of it uh, as we speak now, 25 years later. Whether they uh, revisit that is another matter. But yeah, I think I think back then, Martin, if you remember that, a lot of people thought the American model for professional sports was going to be the the one that would prevail everywhere eventually. So we we all thought that one town, one team um, was an inevitability, uh, and we didn't know as much as we do now about IP. Um, <clears throat> we didn't know that um, that a, a jersey and colours would actually be bankable things like they are now so back then South Sydney players were picking weeds at Redfern Oval before training because they couldn't pay a groundsman to do it and we all thought of South Sydney as a struggling inner city club that was on borrowed time of course we know what happened since and what happened since is why the NRL aren't going to mark their 25th anniversary this year they're not making a big deal of it because they kick Souths out and they don't want to remind people of that so it's just you and me you have to remind people of that but now Hollywood movie stars uh, where, where um, um, you know, um, South Sydney uh, um, caps and all that sort of stuff. And, and, and it isn't so important where the teams are. It's more important what their identity is. So we've, we've got more of an, an English appreciation of professional sport where you can have uh, two clubs very close together. As long as you've got enough TV money, uh, um, you can prop the clubs up and they don't have to be in Perth. They don't, and, and you can just play games in Perth state of origins in Adelaide, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So our whole understanding of, of the way professional sport works has changed in the last 25 years. And you're right, Peter Volandis is the um, chairman of the NRL, and he said five and a half hours is too long on a plane for a professional sportsman. Well, it's, you know, what's the N stand for if you can't travel to Perth? I, I just thought it was an outrageous <laughs> comment. Yeah. yeah. Look, and I'm just looking at the 1997 ARL clubs here. Manly stay, Gold Coast stay, St. George and Illawarra combined, Parramatta stay, North Sydney and Manly actually combined, Newcastle stay, but Western Suburbs and Belmain combined. So in the end, South Sydney stayed, even though they tried to kick them out, of course. So in the end, a lot of those clubs, the ARL clubs, did they have to combine? Yeah, well, I mean, the the I mean, Gold Coast and Souths, as you mentioned, went out and came back in again. It's a different Gold Coast team now, but yeah. So the News Limited um, teams were already sorted financially. Uh, you know, there was a there was a meeting in uh, in on December nineteen. Uh, 1997 at the Sydney Football Stadium where they all agreed to go into business uh, with uh, News Limited and they did so because they were broke. They did so because uh, their own TV deal with Optus Vision, which no longer exists, was was expiring uh, and they, they really didn't have a choice. So uh, that, that is the reason that the Sydney um, uh, uh, Super League clubs survive in their own right and a lot of the New South Wales ARL clubs are forced to merge. It's because basically News Limited uh, guaranteed the futures of those um, Super League clubs. That's not to say that uh, Penrith and Canterbury and Cronulla weren't pressured. They were. I mean, I, I had a, a book launch at uh, at Cronulla where you know Peter Gow showed up, uh, and they talked about going to peace meetings with St George and and going to merger meetings with St George, and and the, the fact that the Super League uh, teams were under some pressure uh, to merge, but they didn't have to in the end. And and that's right. The ARL clubs. Um, were were more uh, um, susceptible to financial pressure, much, much more susceptible to financial pressure and having to make those tough decisions than the Super League clubs were. Steve Mascourt is with us. Two tribes, the untold story of the Super League war, the rebirth of the NRL. You know, you lost Western Suburbs, 90 seasons. Uh, you lost Belmain, 90 seasons. You lost North Sydney, 90 seasons. 
Is that is that good or bad for the competition? Have you know what I'm trying to get at is I mean there are diehard fan, fans from all of those clubs. Look, I was a Belmain fan, mate, which is why I patched over to the Warriors because I hated West so much. I didn't want anything to do with them, and a lot of <laughs> Belmain fans actually felt like that. You know, I know that this is a lost generation now. We're all getting old, and our voices, you know, become tired and boring, and the TikTok generation don't really give a give a stuff about us. But is this something lost or or not, or or should we just all move on from that? Yeah, well, I'm an Illawarra fan, uh, Martin. So I was. Okay. Our club's been gone. Our club's gone longer than it was ever around. So how old do you think that makes me feel? Um, but um, yeah, I think obviously something was lost because, as I said, we now see the value of IP in sport and how old something is and how um, uh, we feel emotionally attached to a, a set of colours or, or an emblem. And, and back then it was um, as we were more in an American mindset where it was, uh, you know, we're going to move clubs around the map like like chess pieces on, on a chessboard. And basically these ma- it was like it was. I, and it's, a, it's not a good thing to. Um, um, I don't. I don't want to compare sport to seismology, especially at the moment with the tragic events overseas. But it was like there was just this moving of these plates, um, um, uh, which had been dormant for, for 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 as you said, 90 years. And and you were lucky if you uh, if you if you made the right call or you woke up on the wrong side of the bed, and you were unlucky if you didn't um, during this period. And certainly. Uh, brands like Bal- Balmain and West and Norths um, and, and St George is the standalone club. Um, you know they they have enormous uh, uh, value, and that IP has been has definitely been uh, lost to the game. And the location of clubs doesn't matter as much as it did back then because now we have TV rights, as I said, and the central body pays each club more than the total cost of the players. So the entire salary of every club is more than covered by the central funding. So yeah, it was. It was wasteful, and in an ideal world, you would not have done it that way. Um, I, I agree with you com- uh, completely. Steve Mascord with us. Uh, you know, the only parallel I can draw people to modern day times is the Live Golf and the PGA. And it's got, you know, I mean, there is no mm-hmm. parallel. I mean, th- these are worlds apart, but what you've got is you've got this nasty internal war going on in a sport where players are. Well, I was going to say they're being asked to choose. They're being paid to choose. I mean, let's be honest about it. The, the brown paper bag stuff that went on, is that is that ever going to be admitted? Are players, uh, clubs, coaches ever going... I'm going? I know it went on. You know it went on. I've got players that have actually told me that they walked into a meeting. There was a bag in the corner. Nobody said anything. They just picked it up and walked out with it. Um, that, you know, there were safes full of cash. And that's how these deals all got done. And some of the players, I don't need to name them, but some of the players said to me they got paid telephone numbers. Does all of that need to come out now? I mean, do we need to actually just pick the scab off that and be honest about it? Well, I don't think this is the worst period in the game's history for that sort of behaviour, Martin, because there was no salary cap. <laughs> you know, when the Super League war broke out, it was open uh, what players were being paid. And it came out in court. Uh, there was no rules that needed to be broken or no secrets that needed to be uh, kept. Uh, I think that sort of stuff more happened after when we tried to bring everything back within a salary cap. We had notional salary caps and the 1999 grand final was St. George Illawarra who was who were basically you know two whole clubs who uh, were openly they were allowed to spend more than the cap. They had notional value to fit them in, inside the cap. And of course Melbourne which was uh, you know which was basically uh, you know Hunter Mariners uh, and Perth with a few Gold Coast players and a few people from London Broncos as well. Again, they were openly allowed to spend more than the cap so so that the club could get off the ground. And so the two teams spending the most uh, played in the 1999 uh, grand final. Um, I think some of the paper bag stuff you're talking about uh, more happened before the war and since the war when because we had salary caps or because we had other restrictions um, uh, that 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 uh, people had to be dishonest but during this period you could be openly greedy it was celebrated that's the whole thing it was it was it, you know it, it was it was about greed uh, you know this period um, so I don't think as I said, if you want to find out what people are being paid, uh, 95, 96, 97, you just got to look in the paper because all the figures were published. 
Steve Mascord, what a, it's a, what a fantastic idea for a, for a book. Every league fan, you've got to get this and read it. It's just, it, it's a historical account, but it involves so much more than that. It's a soap opera as well. It's underhanded, it's devious, there's dodgy dealings, there's villains, there's heroes, there's characters all over the joint. Two Tribes, the untold story of the Super League War and the birth of the NRL. If people want to get hold of a copy of this, I mean, I, you know, you and me, we'd go into a bookshop and we'd ask somebody behind a counter. That doesn't happen these days, mate. What's the best way to get hold of it? Yeah, it's it's not that easy anymore for a lot of reasons I won't bore the listeners with. But um, the best way to get hold of it is um, by going to stevemascord.com forward slash product forward slash two tribes. Uh, it's also available on, uh, you know, Amazon. You might find it on uh, Trade Me or or uh, eBay or stuff like that. But uh, the easiest way to get a copy uh, straight from me, uh, and I won't sign it because the value goes down if I yeah. sign it. But uh, uh, it's, it's Steve Mascord stevemascord.com forward slash product forward slash two tribes and of course if um, anyone's listening in, in Auckland and they want to come tonight there'll be some people there I hope I'm not going to drop any names in case they don't show up but I'm, I'm thinking there'll be some people there uh, who um, you will want to sign it you won't want my signature in it but there'll be some genuine uh, um, you know uh, um, uh, stars of the year of two tribes hopefully uh, there tonight